Sup dudes, I'm back and ready to continue informing the general Spongebob viewer on the classic episode's greater meanings and observations. I'm excited for today's presentation, mainly due to the fact that pizza delivery is one of everyone's all-time favorite episodes. For one, there are 11 different locations in this episode. Generally within your regularly scheduled Spongebob program, there will be different scenes within only one or two, maybe three locations. 1. Krusty Krab 2. Krusty Krab Parking Lot 3. The Middle of Nowhere 4. Hitchhiking Scene 5. Sandstorm Slash Tornado 6. Algae Rock 7. Krusty Krab Pizza 8. Middle of Nowhere 2.0 Slash Pizza Check 9. Rock 10. Customer's House 11. Back to the restaurant. Be sure to stay tuned for Home Sweet Pineapple as well. We begin with the Krusty Crew getting ready to close down for the night. So based on information we learned in a previous presentation, the Krusty Crab closes at 6. Technically, the Plankton episode doesn't tell us this, however, chronology aside, the Krusty Crab training video is the best information we have to go off of. Mr. Krabs says, Our delivery squid will bring it right over. Followed by, We don't deliver, but you do. The customer doesn't even give an address. Also, if you've never noticed this, Mr. Krabs lets go of the phone to elastically hang it up. You can hear the customer continue talking as if he wasn't finished with his order. Bring it right over. Mister. Keep this tiny detail in mind for events that transpire later on in the episode and it may somewhat shift your view of what you remember. The Heads is our first known account of seeing bathroom facilities in the Krusty Krab. Head is sailor talk for toilet. It's been common terminology for a few centuries due to old ship designs placing the toilets at the bow or head of the ship. The waves coming off the ship's breaking edge would then act as a natural way to quote flush the toilet. I did not know this. In fact, I always thought of the head as being the head slash mouth of the actual plumbing. Getting to location number two of this episode, we find the crew clamoring around this conveniently placed boat. After the boat inspection, Spongebob and Squidward are ready to get a move on. Spongebob obviously doesn't know how to drive, but being pressured by Squidward, he attempts to operate the vehicle in a panic-stricken way. Quick sidebar, Squid tosses his hat overboard and doesn't have the hat for the rest of the episode, but Spongebob does. We gotta check out these symbols to see if any translate back to English. I'm really hoping that these aren't culturally appropriated. So it's actually Korean. The first one is accurate, translating to go forward. The depiction of reverse in Korean here actually translates to go back. Spongebob clearly pushed the shifter forwards which one would fairly assume the boat would have plowed right through the Krusty Krab. If you notice the sky in these scenes, it's awfully dark, which makes sense, given they were just closing the restaurant. The boat also features the steering wheel on the right side of the cockpit, which is interesting. It's certainly not a Korean vehicle in that case. As we find ourselves at location number three, the middle of nowhere, we can infer the delivery boys have reversed an extremely long distance, far from the outskirts of town. The pizza would for sure be absolutely frozen stiff at this point, even if it was in a pizza insulator thing. The boat driving itself away after Squidward rightfully yeets the crap out of it instills a sense of hopelessness among our pizza crew. Now it's full daylight. I think they reversed so far they jumped into a new time zone. Or another possible conclusion is they reversed for 10 hours somehow. I ought to bring this up now, as I failed to mention it in prior episodes. Periodically, when the characters are really far from the camera, the audio guys added a subtle reverb slash echo effect to the voices. It's accurate, not overused, and adds a third dimension to the audio. Very nice. We're in the middle of nowhere! You said it, Squidward. The guys attempt to hitchhike after a decent amount of walking, which isn't a bad idea. In fact, in certain situations, that could be the determining factor of survival. Even imagining they had cell phones, there's no way you'd get any bars outside the city, especially in the late 90s. What is it? Truck! 
16 wheels. 16 wheels. You know we gotta count them. Six wheels on the truck. How many on the trailer? Alright, so it ends up being a 24 wheeler in total. Shout out to Squidward for literally saving Spongebob from getting misted by this truck. These big rigs are absolutely cannot stop as quickly as normal vehicles. Inertia versus braking force. Although Spongebob was correct about it being a big truck, in my attempt to make something of this, I'm going to say that it just confirms Spongebob's technique wasn't super accurate in terms of uh, tires. 24 wheels is a lot too. Standard American commercial semi will have 18 wheels, maxing out at 22 wheels if it's a twin trailer. But also, Australia has these road trains which have, in this image, a very unimpressive 86 wheels. I've been paying close attention to Pizza Box continuity, and up to this point, it's been spot on, with that text going from bottom left to top right. However, in this one frame, the Pizza Box isn't totally colored in. No big deal. They're in a tornado. After they land, Squidward freaks out as now they are even more lost than before. Ah, oh, don't tell me, Jethro. The pioneers. That's right. Squidward calls SpongeBob Jethro twice during this episode, here and once at the end. I seriously had no idea why at first, but upon further investigation, he must be referring to Jethro Tull. Oh, no, not that one the English agriculturist who invented something called a seed drill in the year 1700. So definitely a pioneer. Try saying that three times fast. English agriculturist. English... Nah. Now we are at location number eight. Still very lost and very tired. Ew, mushrooms. Really? I guarantee by this point that pizza is totally covered in sand. What an excellent use of their energy reserves. Infighting during a survival situation is pretty much guaranteed, especially if Squidward is on your team. When Spongebob is celebrating that they're now saved, during the push-ups, his necktie droops down like it would in real life. Whoever integrated that into the animation deserves a medal. The music in this scene is the title card music, by the way. It's been most likely a good 12 to 24 hours since they've left the Krusty Krab. The pizza has been through a sandstorm, a tornado, turned into a parachute, not to mention extremely room temperature. The team arrives at the customer's house. Based on Mr. Krabs hanging up the phone early, one, how did they know the address? Also, the customer may have been explaining he wants some sort of drink or something. Perhaps a diet Dr. Kelp. Of course, it's a fat, hairy guy. I know you all remember this part very clearly, the climax and utter tragedy of the pizza delivery. How am I supposed to eat this pizza without my drink? Pull up. Drink! Headshot. Drink! Sit down. Drink! Stand up. Drink! This is heartbreaking. Squidward makes things right in an act of true pizza delivery partnership. I firmly believe this red barnacle head is rated number one on the dink meter. The pair make it back to presumably begin yet another day of work. Odds are Mr. Krabs won't believe anything that just happened to them. Not only did Spongebob and Squidward survive this unfortunate ordeal, Squidward truly showed his caring side considering this whole thing was Spongebob's fault. One could argue that Squidward pressured Spongebob into driving the boat in the first place, but in the end, Squidward was able to let everything go and take care of business with the terrible customer. Even when you're in a really crappy situation such as this episode, it's important to be able to reset your frustration and deal with whatever you have to deal with, no matter whose fault it was. Let's see... Our second act today is Home Sweet Pineapple, an episode dedicated to everyone whose living situation turned to absolute crap. Another one of those episodes that takes place exclusively on Conch Street, Spongebob's Neighborhood. Well, except for this part where the nematodes eat Fred's car. Oh, dang, nematodes. One interesting observation with Fred's boat is the propeller stops spinning shortly after the assumed engine is eaten. This was either done on purpose for that reason, or simply so the nematodes wouldn't get maimed by the screw in the aft of the boat on live television. Either way, I bet you never noticed that before. 
the nematodes are thirsty and find the closest source of hydration in the area, which ends up being SpongeBob's pineapple. I really love the cinematics in this part as the camera angle pans over from just showing Patrick's rock to fixating on SpongeBob's doomed house. The pineapple's usual array of floral shrubbery is missing, obviously to allow access for the nematodes. If we pause here and look around SpongeBob's room, I notice a couple really neat things here. For one, it would appear this attack is taking place in the wee hours of the morning, since the alarm clock goes off shortly after this. Secondly, this trapdoor on the floor is interesting. There was a trapdoor in this room in the boating school episode, but it was made out of sand and located across the room under the calendar. The only other time we've seen Spongebob's room so far is in Plankton and in Help Wanted. We also find this is the second appearance of Spongebob's pet scallop, which is barely visible in our episode today. In Jellyfish Jam later on, the trapdoor is in the exact same spot, but the poor scallop is gone. This trapdoor is also seen in Sandy's Rocket, Squeaky Boots, and Opposite Day, in Season 1 at least. Oh, and don't forget about Suds. But in these other five episodes in Season 1, no trapdoor to be found. It's almost like they were teasing us with it, and it probably gets used at some point. We don't see it after Opposite Day until Season 2, Episode 1, Something Smells. In fact, I firmly believed the trapdoor was in Battle from Bikini Bottom from 2003, but nope. Hey, enough about the stupid trap door! The house is shrinking rapidly at this point, but the living room remains relatively unhindered besides the- Shell phone! Whitward, help me! My house is shrinking! I woke up this morning and I was getting smaller! Let's add a vaporwave filter on this part and see if we can actually understand what Spongebob's saying. Oh my god, that is incredible. All these years. So clearly, Spongebob knew of nematodes, but never had them before. It's a bikini bottom version of termites, basically. We all know what they do, and passive-aggressive sigh of defeat is all you can muster. So the two besties decide to build a new pineapple so Spongebob doesn't have to move back in with his mom and dad. Because who wants to do that? Another great and horrifying joke for the parents watching along. These two are actual units. What's even better is if I were to pick any three tools for my EDC, it would be a flathead, a hammer, and vice grips. So they got two of them at least. And the channel locks on his right side count as a good enough for me. They don't need to use power tools. Power tools are for sissies. Oh. Oh. I wish I lived there. Really? No. One bedroom. <laughs> I never laughed at the one bedroom joke until today. That's specifically targeted at 20 something year olds. Did I mention this is the greatest show of all time? Gary, where did you come from? Where did he go? Why did he just drive right over those shards of obvious glass pieces? I'm glad he was safe because that dude did not have a hard hat on. Do starfish actually sleep under rocks? The fighting over the covers part could be considered an adult joke. What I really want to know is why doesn't Spongebob just scooch in closer to the rock seeing as Patrick's house is currently on no interior mode so he's not going to fall through the center. Here's a fun fact, Patrick doesn't have a nose. Remember the Patrick's nose install episode? He does rip a nose hair out in a more classic episode at Mr. Krabs house so whatever. If your friend doesn't currently have a nose though, I wouldn't recommend corking their mouth shut. Once you start focusing on the slide whistles and cartoons, it's a whole different experience. Okay. Yeah, this is a real swell place you got here. Thanks, buddy. You're welcome. SpongeBob scooches over the pillow while disarming Squiddy with a 3 a.m. small talk. A great little detail. If I had done this episode last year with the popularity of this meme, it probably would have got a lot more views. Alright, only one sock this time. Now, it's morning. Seeing as Spongebob didn't go back to Patrick's, probably, did he just sleep on the pineapple foundation? 
Where'd he get these belongings? Does he have a storage unit somewhere locally? Probably because these bags have floral designs on them and it warded off the nematodes. Is it just me or is Squidward like a couple inches taller? I get the vibes that the Squidward animator was out sick that day. SpongeBob, hi honey, we're here! Come on SpongeBob, hurry hurry son, your mother has dinner waiting. Such a boomer way to pull up to your child's house. I just noticed this in post via my natural music talent, I guess. The horn on Mr. and Mrs. Squarepants' vehicle is the same exact soundbite from the beginning of the episode when SpongeBob's alarm clock is shrinking. The second tone, specifically. SpongeBob. SpongeBob's green cap got in the way of the moment here, so it had to be deleted. Okay, underwater photosynthesis is absolutely fucking crazy. With the pineapple back, this proves that even when your real life living situation may seem dire, or even if you suffer a devastating loss, it's important to have friends or parents you can lean on when you're dealt a wild card. It is unrealistic for your situation to improve in a matter of 45 seconds, but try to always be prepared for such events. It will always get better. Unless you're a Squidward.